good morning or good afternoon from wherever you're joining from. Uh, we're going to give people a couple of moments to trickle in, but thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Ellie. I am operations lead here at Cohere for AI, and I am delighted to kick off in conjunction with Sarah Hooker, head of Cohere for AI, our first fireside chat. Uh, welcome to episode one. Uh, very excited today for our guest. Before we get underway, I'm going to talk a little bit about Cohere for AI, who we are and what we do. We are a nonprofit research lab, and we're a community dedicated to contributing fundamental research and machine learning, working to solve some of the field's most challenging problems. Our programs include supporting community-driven research, which if you haven't applied to join our absolutely bustling Discord, you should do that. We'll put the link in the chat shortly. Um, so community-driven research across fundamental machine learning topics. We recently launched our Cohere for AI Scholars program, and we have full-time research positions in our lab. And today, our first fireside chat, uh, our first one in our speaker series. And fundamentally, our mission is changing where, how, and by whom research is done. And we're very excited to continue that mission today. Um, welcome to episode one. Lots of speaker series focus on research. Ours focuses on people. Fireside chats bring together leading researchers and rising stars in the field of machine learning to discuss their research learning journeys. Research is an inherently human endeavor, and this discussion series provides insights from beginning to breakthrough. So I am now going to turn it over to Sarah to welcome our first Fireside Chat guest. Sarah, please take it away. Uh, thanks, Ellie. Uh... Sammy, are you ready for this? <laughs> Our inaugural speaker, the precious high. <laughs> um, uh, hope it should be fine. Should be fine. I, I, yeah, I think we had to let me, uh, I, I want to briefly introduce for everyone here, Sammy, and this is really special because it's our first chat in the series, and I was thinking who would make sense for this particular chat. And Sammy is both an incredibly accomplished researcher, one of the leaders of our field. He's currently the senior director of AI and machine learning research in Apple. Uh, previously, he spent a long part of his career uh, leading Google Brain. Uh, he has a long research career in deep learning. Um, with the honor of publishing papers with the name Deep Learning back in the 1990s. There's a uh, few that can <laughs> claim that badge. Um, uh, and he's also perhaps most importantly, a personal mentor of mine, someone I really look up to. Even when we were starting this lab, so Ellie just told you a little bit about the lab. We're a baby lab, we've been around six months. And so we're building uh, really this idea that we can change how research is done. And I remember I, Sammy was one of the first people I called where I was like, this is slightly terrifying and also really exciting. What do I do? And so it's really special to have him here with all of you because uh, I really look up to him. And I think it's, uh, it's particularly fun because in preparing for this fireside chat, uh, I discovered new things, and so <laughs> the pressure's on, Sammy. <laughs> um, so I have, uh, a, I, I've roughly grouped our questions by uh, what I'll call uh, uh, the beginning, the foundations, and the future, um, and so maybe we can start with the beginning. Um, so you both shared this with me, uh, as well as I saw it mentioned in an interview, you describe your parents as hippies. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? I think they were uh, non-conventional parents, for sure, at the, at the time. Um, not focused necessarily on their career, but more focused on uh, understanding the world and looking at what was happening around them. And there was a lot of hippies around them. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, in France, the, the 60, 68 uh, revolution and and uh, people were you know, reconsidering what it meant to, what power meant, uh, how how we should like educate ourselves and things like that. And I think these values uh, came true. 
And for those that don't know, what was the 1968 uh, France Revolution? It was when there were strikes universally, almost universally across France, is that? Yeah, first, uh, I think it was not just universities, it's all workers, but, uh, but it took off uh, with universities. Uh, and indeed, they were reconsidering what it meant uh, for universities to exist, what, uh, what was the future of, of education in France and future of, of work as well. So they were in the street, they were uh, uh, manifesting, they were protesting against the system and, and every evening they would go down the street and, and, and shout what they thought would be good. And we were kids at the time, uh, Joshua and I, and we were just watching that. <laughs> and, and I guess that, that forged our view of the world. In what way? In, uh, I, I guess in uh, always questioning <laughs> the system, <laughs> not uh, necessarily uh, taking it for granted, um, but also in, in trying to understand it, uh, trying to understand uh, the world in general and not just uh, doing whatever you're told to do. <laughs> and what uh, brought your family to Canada? So I think my parents didn't really know what what to do, we lived in many places in France and also in Morocco. And at some point, my brother and I visited Montreal because we had uh, our grandma, were, grandpa were living there. And uh, so we just went, my brother and I, we were like 10, I think. And we visited Montreal and we thought it was the right place to be. <laughs> we <laughs> told that to our parents and they said, okay, Time to change. Let's move on. <laughs> so they just went with it. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I resonate because I have to describe my parents as European hippies. Uh, I feel like they also have moved a lot and maybe had different sense of what drives you to different places. Um, yeah. What is one thing that you think of that you liked about your childhood and one thing that you didn't like? Uh, it might actually be the same. Uh, <laughs> what I think I remember the most is that my parents were very different from any other parents of my friends. <laughs> and that was, depending on the time, both uh, uh, difficult to accept and also uh, very proud of. So at some age when your parents are different and everybody is asking you, okay, so what are your parents doing? And they, there was no easy answer to that <laughs> because they were not like your typical uh, worker. Uh, but at some point you realize that it's actually a plus that they are different, that they look differently, that they think differently, that they are open to different things. So through time, my view changed from why am I so different to wow, I'm happy to be so different. Yeah, it, uh, it, that's really interesting. I had a similar moment of crystallization um, uh, and I feel like it takes a while. Like you have to be at a, it, it, it's almost when you see your parents in different perspectives as you go through life. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, we were both in a, a YouTube video <laughs> at some point and uh, one of the okay. questions that were asked of both of us was, uh, what inspires you starting out? And your response made me laugh so much because you said that you were motivated to join a PhD because after undergraduate, you didn't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> and you were looking for ways to avoid going to work. Um, but uh, I'm giving you the opportunity to add more nuance to your answer. <laughs> the truth is that I... I First, I chose to do a degree in computer science because uh, before going to university, my brother and I explored computers by our own. We bought a small computer. We just uh, had fun with it. And the fact that you could actually do a career with that was quite new at the time. And we thought, and I thought, okay, that sounds like the easiest degree I could get because I don't, I don't see myself as working. <laughs> But this was easy to do, so it was like a, a way forward without thinking, and it was actually the easiest thing I've done. <laughs> That's true. But once this was done, I wasn't still sure what I could do uh, as work. And I did work for like a summer, for two months, in a real job, <laughs> computer science job. And 
it was not very exciting in terms of challenges. And so that's true. I actually went back to doing a PhD, mostly because I, I didn't see anything interesting to do outdoor. Um, but then the topic was not that easy to do. And um, at the time, Joshua had already started his PhD and he was exploring approaches like uh, hidden markup models for speech recognition and, and a bit neural networks uh, by then. And I was fascinated by the fact that you could use uh, uh, examples of how the, the brain works to actually do interesting math and computer science. And so I did that topic because I thought it was interesting, not definitely not because I thought there was like a, a big opportunities in the future or, or not. It was just as a, as a way to, to have fun and understand the world. What was your computer science job? <laughs> what jobs <laughs> existed at that point in Montreal? This is so interesting. <laughs> at the time, they, they had the, not mainframes, but the, like big computers that were used for uh, accounting and things like that. So uh, it's really not fun jobs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess maybe I was not a, a good student, by the way. So I, I didn't have uh, uh, probably the best opportunities. <laughs> Uh, because I mostly spent my time having fun with my friend, organizing parties, and <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting that you bring up um, kind of the 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 topic that you first started working on, and um, so uh, I was looking through the list of your publications on your website, and first of all, I was impressed that you've kept it up to date. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ever go to Sammy's website, it's a very old, formative website, but the list of publications is very up to date. So he is even <laughs> up to 2022. Um, but I was going scrolling all the way back, and even in the early 1990s, you had papers with deep neural networks in the title. So you had, you know, taking on the curse of dimensionality and joint distributions using neural networks. You had neural network to detect homologies and proteins. And it was interesting for a few reasons. So this is a paper, these are papers that emerged in the 1990s. They, they're kind of a, a badge and honor. There were very few people working on deep neural networks then. Um, I, I also think it's interesting because you've collaborated on a few of them with your brother. Um, the yeah. one on homologies was interesting because in some ways Yashua is still and now Emmanuel is all working on this topic still. So it shows some stubborn perseverance. We're still <laughs> trying to, now it's uh, interesting, kind of the persistence of this question. Um, but maybe to start with, I just wanted to ask, um, what was the feel like at this time? So, you know, how do you even bump into yeah, <laughs> hidden Markov models? Yeah. Like, yeah, so. I think, uh, so Joshua, I guess, uh, uh, worked with uh, faculty that was at McGill and where he was doing his PhD. And that person was a speech expert. And at the time, this was the technique that was used, but he quickly, decided that maybe there were other approaches. And I think actually quickly met uh, uh, Jan Lequin and, and Jeff Intermajor, who with whom he's been working with for many years afterward. And I was, I think, very lucky to be able to quickly get into knowing these people as well uh, through Joshua's connection. Um, the homology thing was because we had a friend who had done a bioinformatics uh, degree and he was interested in understanding these questions. And then we talked to him and said, oh, well, we have these neural nets that maybe we could use. They seem to be useful to do many things. Why not trying to uh, you know, predict uh, a few things about them? Uh, back then, it was just trying to predict whether the two molecules were from the same family, so very high level. Uh, and then the, we have to understand it's the 90s. The networks are not that big. Uh, you may have a few hundreds <laughs> of hidden units or even uh, parameters, uh, much smaller than whatever you can think of today. Um, so everything was smaller. Compute was smaller. Everything is very different. There was no real uh, interest in really changing the world at the time, but more trying things and, uh, and see what was happening. Uh, 
very, very different. My, my PhD thesis at the time was on, uh, on using neural networks to develop new learning algorithms for neural networks. So it was really like a very introspection thing. Today, we call that AutoML, uh, and, and it's been a big hit for many years, uh, but that was 25 years ago. It was not a big hit. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I, I almost um, want to uh, ask you to try and paint the picture just so uh, it, I, I think uh, maybe to start with, like what was the available compute? So what did the lab look like? <laughs> uh, we had this these machines called the Sun Microsystems. And, oh, yeah, yeah. And so that was already uh, Linux based and uh, we, we're using uh, LaTeX to write our papers. So did, that didn't change. But uh, we, of course, there were no libraries of anything. There was no PyTorch or TensorFlow or anything like that. So we had to write our code from the ground up. So very early on, we wrote multiple machine learning libraries because you, we were thinking about all the problems that we wanted to solve. And there was, of course, nothing out there it was very, I mean, the whole field was maybe two or 300 people total. And we would meet once in a while, like at NeurIPS. Even ICML was not really the place to go at the time because it was more um, what we were calling at the time more classical machine learning. So uh, discrete models, trees, and things like that. And only NeurIPS uh, and uh, the learning workshop, uh, so Snowbird, were the only places where you could uh, really see these these kind of approach uh, front and center. So not a lot of places to go. Uh, submitting papers were done uh, by sending a true on paper wow. <laughs> version. It was many months in the working. Uh, slides were real slides that you could show with overheads. <laughs> Very different well. <laughs> Do you still have, so I remember when I first, uh, one of the first pieces of advice Dimitri ever gave me was collect every mug from your apps. This is, he's like, he's got all his mugs. Did they have mugs back then? Did you start collecting yes. your mug every year? <laughs> Talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I have like all of them and that's cover. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I do um, have here, by the way, all the all the books like uh, wow is, is the first first nerds <laughs> wow i'm yeah. even more impressed you made the effort to bring them all into your office <laughs> i feel like <laughs> there's no place otherwise <laughs> <laughs> being kicked down <laughs> um uh it's interesting so uh i also wanted to ask about uh really an early paper that you think of is important to your growth as a researcher and why wow <laughs> um let's see <laughs> i what i could talk about uh, so there's what i did for my phd which was trying to see if like gradient descent was really the right thing to use to train models. Uh, in the end, the answer is mostly yes. <laughs> but but uh, the fact that we were questioning at the very heart how we can train models, I think was uh, for me uh, important to think that you can question basically everything. There's no such part of the process that you should not question. And uh, that was important. And that, um, in a way for me, you know, research is is a very exploratory process. You should try to find something that uh, no one else is working on. But if it was to work, it would have a big impact on, on the field and maybe on society. Um, so questioning, like even the the the, the fundamental mechanisms of of machine learning, was uh, a good journey for me. Even though at the end it didn't pan out significantly. I think it panned out in how we should do research. And uh, that was important for me. Uh, I really liked most of the papers I wrote with my brother. I think uh, he was definitely a very good uh, source of uh, ideas and, and structure. <laughs> so all of them were good. 
Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned uh, tooling earlier, so I, I wanted to pick up on that. So you're one of the three authors of Theano, and Theano... Not Theano, Torch. Oh, sorry, before Theano. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go one further back. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who are just maybe coming in and have only known TensorFlow, uh, it was, uh, I guess there was Lush, there was Torch, there was Theano, and then there was uh, TensorFlow. And uh, it's interesting, this progression of tooling, and, and tell me if I'm missing someone one in between. <laughs> You're likely missing many of them, <laughs> because uh, at the time, like in the 90s, there were many people trying to write good libraries, but not many yeah. willing to share them. So everyone had their own libraries. And... Uh, uh, Jan has had his own, uh, Joshua and his lab were writing their own. And I was at the time, I was a research scientist in, in Switzerland and uh, we wrote our own torch, uh, which lately, later became PyTorch. But I think what we did, which was probably the difference is that we made it public very quickly. As soon as we could, we made it open. And uh, back then it was, there was not that many open library that that were um, modular enough that it could be used for more than just one research project. Uh, so it did have an impact. Interestingly, um, I guess, so the three, uh, we were three writing this library and one of the three, uh, the main one was uh, Ronald Colbert. He was doing that during his PhD and um, he did his PhD with me. And at some point decided to move to Montreal to continue his PhD with Joshua. And there he saw that there was another library in the making. <laughs> and so there was some competition about which library would be the best. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the great driver of progress. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, we kept working on, on Torch like through the years. But I think uh, so Torch was there. And in Montreal, they were building Piano. There was a fundamental difference between Torch and Theano, which is reflected now today in the modern world in the difference between TensorFlow and, 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 and PyTorch. Uh, so TensorFlow is like Theano was, a, group, a place where you build a graph of computation and then you just uh, run the graph. Uh, and uh, while Torch uh, and PyTorch <laughs> We're more about uh, functional programming, so you you actually write the code that you want to 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 launch, and uh, and it's usually much easier to understand what will happen and debug. But it might be less efficient at at uh, at inference time because you can't really uh, do uh, efficient. You have to compile computing. the graph, yeah. So these were the two fundamental ways that twenty years ago, and they are still <laughs> there. Although you can see how TensorFlow has tried to move towards PyTorch and PyTorch move towards TensorFlow. So there's combinations of the two. And now, that's, yeah, that's really fascinating. I want to pick up on something you said, which is um, this idea of open sourcing your code. I think in many ways, the machine learning community stands out uh, in terms of its emphasis on open source and publishing even within industry labs or other spaces in which research is done, why do you think machine learning is so unique in this respect? Uh -huh. It's hard to know. I think um, first, <laughs> I, I think reproducibility is, is a big problem in our field. It's, it's easy to write uh, a paper that says we've done this and we've done that. And in maybe in some fields, trying to reproduce doesn't take too much time. But in our field, as we go, it's getting more and more difficult to actually write the code that will reproduce the algorithm that you described in your paper. And there are so many details. And it's so easy to um, forget one detail or even to be fooled by your own algorithm and you know, uh, uh, trying on the test set or the, things like that. So from the beginning, being able to provide the code um, was a way to show that your science was actually good. It's We're still not there. <laughs> Maybe we're better than other fields, but uh, I think it is a crucial thing. One thing that we, one of the reasons we, we open source Torch back then was also because 
it's much easier for people to to try a new idea based on your, your own idea if you provide the code because they will try it and then they will say, oh, but you could add this function or this idea on top of it. And so they will build on your research. And that's what, as a researcher, you should always aim at. You're not providing science and then say, okay, we're done. It's just one step in the right direction. And so you want others to keep working on that journey. Providing the code was definitely the, the main reason for that. Uh, I think it's, um, I want to switch topics a bit. Uh, so in the late uh, 1990s, you've alluded to this, your PhD student who switched between you and Yashua, uh, you started uh, supervising PhD students. Uh, what is one early mistake you made and one early success or learning uh, that you think you did right? <laughs> um. <laughs> Let's see, early mistake. These are hard <laughs> to find. I mean, there are plenty, that's not the problem. <laughs> Finding the wine to talk about. <laughs> um, and it doesn't have to be, I guess, to make it less specific to your first poor, like the first yeah. student, it can be your, your PhD supervision as a whole. So uh, let's be clear, it's hard to supervise the PhD students because there's a trade-off between pushing for your own ideas through them uh, and letting them explore the world. And that trade-off is different for everyone. So finding for the right person how much you should give them and how much you should let them explore uh, is hard. So clearly we are making a mistake every day in that trade-off because you need to understand whether that person will come up with a brilliant idea if you let them explore or if they are not going to find something for a long time or reinvent the world too often uh, and how much help they need. So for each person, finding the right level of support is important. I think it can only work if you don't have too many PhD students. So I, I see these labs where there's dozens and dozens and, and more uh, PhD students per faculty. And it, it's hard for the, for the professor to actually have any influence on their PhD students. So. I think that's not a good trade-off, but you know, everyone find the right one. So I was quite lucky to have, I think, a small group, enough group back then. I don't know, five, ten people working with me, and um, of course, all Peruvians. But that's luck as well. <laughs> uh, it's a nice segue to my next question, which is: You've now managed and started several large research groups. Yeah, you know that's where we, we met while I was at Brain. Um, what is the most important for creating an environment in which you can progress on a scientific idea? I, I ask oh. this partly because I'm <laughs> I'm starting C four AI, so this feels like. <laughs> very timely advice. So how do we create spaces in which good research can be done? So when, when I started at Google uh, 15 years ago or so, the environment was very different from today. It was a very small group of people completely independent from each other. There was no cohesion and everyone was free to do what they want. Uh, I think it it was good for me at the time where I was, I already had many years of experience and I could really decide on my own what I want to do. And I was lucky to have good success, but it was probably not a good place to be if you were more junior. Uh, what I discovered along the years is, uh, I mean, the, the type of research that I like to, 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 to create or research environment is an environment where it is based on exploratory driven uh, uh, approaches. So people are, should be free to think about what would be an important thing to do in the world so that it has an impact, but where there's enough uh, trust in each other that uh, you can share and learn from the other ones. And it's not about competition. It's more about how can we work together? How can my idea can be useful for yours and vice versa. Building that environment is not an easy thing to do. And it might also be a matter of size. Smaller is too small and bigger is too big and just something in between. And I don't know the right solution, but I can see, for instance, over the years, how um, you know the group I was uh, 
uh, leading uh, at Google was becoming bigger and bigger, and I was losing uh, the opportunity to, to build that trust as it was becoming too big. Also being able to, to find the right values for that team, again, uh, uh, sharing uh, is, is critical, but also uh, uh, the opportunity to fail is critical. So if, if your evaluation process uh, is only based on the result, no one will take any risk. If it's based on, 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 on taking risks and on, on pro proposing ideas, on sharing these ideas, and where uh, failing is, is still somehow can be rewarded, then I think people will indeed explore more. One thing I discovered probably too late in my life was that when you do exploratory driven research, uh, one way to succeed is to think about very diverse ideas from across the spectra, spectrum. And how do you get these ideas? By having people who themselves are diverse. So there's a critical need of having a set of people who are all different from each other in many ways, where they came from, uh, what they've studied, uh, who they are. All of that is critical so for them to be able to explore differently from each other so that it's uh, they are not like competing with each other. They are just seeing, seeing the world in a different way and together they can do something. And this is at the heart of what should be an exploratory driven research. We need a diversity of people. And it took me a while to understand that, but now I'm, I'm really sure there's no doubt. For the power of a diverse ensemble. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, and there's many people on this call who I think uh, and probably watching this uh, afterwards who are probably just starting out in their journeys. So how should they weigh choices in the spaces in which to do research? So you've, uh, you've both navigated academic settings and industry settings. So uh, what should someone, I think both of these contribute meaningfully to the wider discussion, uh, but do, do you have advice for someone who's yeah. navigating that choice? You know, at the heart, research is a human thing. Mm -hmm. so think about the people. Who are you going to work with? Academia, industry, this place, that place. It's important, but actually critically more important is with whom would you work? Who would be your colleagues, uh, fellow PhD students, uh, faculties around you, if it's uh, academia, uh, or colleagues in, in, in an industrial setting? Are they people that have uh, the values that you you care about because you're going to work every day with them so i think if this is set properly the rest will come and in the values it's also how much opportunities you'll have to contribute to them but for me that's a critical value but you choose your values uh i want to to ask so you and your brother are both leaders in the research field you've mentioned throughout this conversation uh, working on papers together. Uh, what is one idea that you both agree on and one idea that you disagree on? <laughs> uh, well, one idea that we both agree on is that what we do can have a big impact on society. Maybe I didn't believe in it 25 years ago, but today I'm, I'm clearly on that side. And so we have to be careful about what we do, be careful about the ideas that we put forward, about uh, how we organize our own research environment, whether it's labs or the community, because it will have a big impact. I think we both agree on this. Uh, where we may disagree is uh, uh, clearly I work in an industrial setting and Joshua works in academia. And uh, that's because we think these are different ways to get to the point. And, and we disagree that only one way is possible in a way. So it's not a big disagreement, but uh, Yeshua will always uh, stay in academia and stay away from too much uh, uh, funding from industry. And I think, I think there's a lot that uh, uh, these companies can bring to, to the table, uh, whether it's problems, uh, of course, finance, compute, uh, and people. So. Uh, I wanted to take a wider view uh, before we open up 
because there's been a lot of questions as we've been chatting. So I'll open up and I'll select a few for us to go through. But uh, what is one research problem that you think is important to work on right now? Yeah, um, obviously you've seen how these uh, large models trained on large data with large compute have been impacting the world left and right. And why I think it is definitely important to work on those, um, I think there is a big danger that people only work on those. And that's somehow potentially killing the idea of exploring the world if everyone is attracted by the same uh, way to do research. So <laughs> today I am thinking more about how can we work, how can we do more with less? So everything about better using less amount of data or less amount of compute to achieve uh, better models, more under understanding more what they do, I think is something that less people are working on because they're all attracted mm -hmm. with the bigger, the better. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that really resonates with me. I shared a similar, it's not a grumpy perspective, but it's more that it feels like this is not the ultimate question we we will need to answer. Uh, the question of how do we just keep on uh, adding more parameters to the model? I feel like the fundamental question is, this yeah. is a very inefficient way of gaining performance. Yes. Yes. We look so, dumb when we do that. It's yeah. impressive though, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a frustrating formula because I think it's changed our field into the Moore's law of like machine learning, where we just keep on adding more parameters, and it's it's hard because it disincentivizes research off this speed and path because it's you have to tolerate some hit to performance at first as you start to explore other ways to get there. So. I agree. It just feel, but it does feel like the most important question. We need to figure out what comes after this inefficiency way yeah. of gaining this performance. Um, I think there's definitely things to learn from this path, but yeah, be careful of not all going there. Yeah, encourage people to not go there. <laughs> yeah, I uh, so that resonated. Um, I want to ask one last question before we open up. So on your website, you have a, a link to your other website where you talk about your two kids. Oh. <laughs> uh, how has being a dad, uh, how have you balanced being a parent and your career also as a leader in research? It, this is super important. Um, you have to have a life <laughs> first. <laughs> I mean, uh, the parties of back in Montreal. Right? Exactly. You have to have parties. You have to have friends. You have to 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 talk to people who are not doing the same work as you because they have a different view of the world and they, they can actually bring perspectives that we, you may not have if uh, you were only talking to people doing machine learning. And in that respect, uh, the deciding to have a family is is very important and. It, I, when I decided to have a family, of course, I said, okay, I will invest a lot of time and effort in that, which meant put some barrier in your, in your, uh, uh, how you conduct your research. So very early on, I decided I will uh, leave early in the afternoon so they can see my kids. I will uh, uh, spend as much time as possible uh, on my life with them. And it's not easy when you have a big team and lots of responsibilities left and right, but you have to put the barrier because there are other things that you should do in your life than just that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. I'm actually going to dive in. So uh, Nishant asked if Sammy is a PhD student now, what research topic ideas he would work on? I think that was answered by the last question. So yeah. I'm going to actually ask another one. Uh, Max had an excellent one. Max goes, Sammy, what was the most kick-ass party you threw in college? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, one thing I must say, when I was in college in computer science in Montreal, there was something very different from today. The number of um, women and men was about the same. It was like 40, 60, something that is not happening today, unfortunately, and very unfortunately. So the, the parties were uh, definitely much more interesting and uh, uh, you know, I was helping organizing them, so everything could happen. <laughs> uh, Mark Anthony has a very big question, uh, kind of thinking big. He says, what are the biggest trends in the field of machine learning you think will come over the next five years? 
Uh, and then he goes 10 years and then he goes 50 years. So perhaps you can choose one of those denominations. <laughs> Have, like, you know, like when, uh, so when I, when I, you know, I, I started at Apple about a year ago and uh, back then there was not a lot of research happening, uh, or open research happening. One of the way I, I sold uh, what I'm doing and why we need to invest a lot of uh, people and, and time in doing uh, this open research, uh, looking long term is I don't want us to be surfing the current wave. I want us to be surfing the next wave. And to be honest, I don't know what is the next wave, but I want to put everything I can in providing the environment so that the next wave will be seen in our group or will be quickly cut, cut up by our group. So if I knew what it was, uh, I think uh, uh, that I mean, I would be an oracle. I, I know my limits. And uh, the way I do that is by uh, like getting myself with the best people in the world and asking them every day, okay, what do you think about what's happening and what else is coming? So I think for now, I, why I see that the, 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 the wave of the big models will, uh, will have a big impact, I think it will quickly be limited by our understanding of what's happening and also by the risk that we're taking by putting these models out. So uh, pushing more into understanding uh, what's this data, what's these models, why they work, and more importantly, why they do not work is going to be a key to creating the next wave, which I don't know what it is, but understanding it is the key. Yeah, this question also came in a different formulation from Trishan. So I think a lot of people are curious what's next. Yeah. Um, and Neil has an excellent question. He says, what is it like doing research without being on ML Twitter? So you're not on Twitter <laughs> from, from what <laughs> I can <laughs> gather. <laughs> yeah. I am not. I, I am sure there's a lot happening on Twitter, but it's also from what I can see from far away, very uh, stressing uh, for everyone for multiple reasons because it's not just about machine learning it's often about people and uh, I think I see uh, behaviors that I would uh, not like to be part of uh, in these social networks in general so I I prefer that we exchange over only on science and if there was a way I would be there but I see that it's not that and um, so I'd rather not be there. Yeah, Jonathan Lem has an interesting question. Maybe I'll try and reframe it a little. So Jonathan's original question were, what are your thoughts about AGI and how do you think is the most promising approaches that might make AGI closer to reality? I want to reframe this as perhaps, so uh, firstly, how can we be more precise about talking about certain uh, objectives or, you know, is... I think uh, we often talk about things like AGI, but is this something that you think as a field we should center discussion around? Um, wait, I, I perhaps my own, <laughs> perhaps the framing of the question itself, I've been too leading, but go go ahead, Sammy. <laughs> so in fact, the, the, the I in AGI is the, the thing that bothers me the most. We are using the word uh, intelligence without really putting some precise meaning behind it. And so it's everything that we don't understand. It's it's such an unprecise word that uh, you can you can define AGI in as many ways there are people who want to define it. And and some of them are very scary. Uh, some of them are like very long-term views uh, of the world. Some of them are just whatever we do for tomorrow. And I think it's very dangerous in general to use these terms that are unlegal. I'd, I'd rather we focus on today than on whatever will happen in 20 years. Uh, we do need today to understand the risks that we are taking in putting our models out today, not in 20 years, today. So we don't need to have these terms. We don't need to call it like this AGI or whatever. We instead need to understand whatever happens every time we train a model and we try to use it in the real world. What are going to be the consequences, both positive and negative? I think this is what people are afraid of, but we shouldn't be afraid of tomorrow. We should be afraid of today. <laughs> um, yeah, that resonates, I think, uh, uh, I, I think with 
many of my own thoughts with the discussion lately. Um, I think in general science, it's useful when we have precision to how we talk about different objectives and also about different risks. So um, yes. I'm gonna, as, uh, so Andrew and a few others actually, so there's a few questions there along the lines of, um, Actually, maybe I'll start with uh, two questions, which are by Robert and Badisa, and they're kind of asking the same thing, which is, uh, what would you do to advice, one piece of advice you give to an undergraduate before starting or applying to graduate school? And Badisa asks, what advice do you have for those starting out on the ML research journey? So these are both for very early career. Uh, yeah. So do you have a single piece of advice you would give? Yeah. Uh, first, when I was doing uh, my undergrad, I definitely didn't have enough math <laughs> uh, for what we are doing today. So if you can choose your undergrad, you should have at least a good, a good balance between math and computer science. You need computer science to be able to express your ideas on the computer, but you need math to understand where, where this is going and where, uh, uh, what are the limits. The other piece of advice is that uh, you, you need to get your hands dirty. So you need to, before trying to invent the world, you need to be able to reproduce ideas of others. So read a paper and it's not about taking the code that was provided uh, and, and just running it. This is useless because you don't learn anything. It's more about re-implementing from your own perspective what you read and see if you can come to the same result. And doing that, you learn a lot. So implementing code uh, from others uh, or from other algorithms is, is crucial in understanding the, the details. Uh, there's a few questions which are related to the, the research spaces that people contribute in. So Nayan and also, I believe, Andrew earlier both ask a variation of this. So Nayan says, what are your thoughts on independent research? Would my research be more valued if I had, uh, if I was a PhD student? So independent research means you're not in any structure that you, like whether it's academia or, or industry. I think, <laughs> I think it just means you're outside of an academic institution. Uh, uh, maybe I'm making that more broad because I think Andrew's comment is about uh, doing research with someone who doesn't want to go back to academia for a PhD. Yeah, as you know, Sarah, we there we had people in, in at Google in the brain team who didn't have a PhD but were still offered to have enough uh, 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 possibilities to to do their own research. Uh, and I think it really depends on your environment. Working alone is hard, uh, not only because you you need people to bounce your ideas to. Uh, having an idea is actually like 1% of the work. Yeah. You, and, and there's so much more things to do after the, you had the idea. You need to, to push it towards other people. You need to confront it to uh, the world uh, differently. You need other people to check that your ideas are good. And you should do that before you spend an, enough uh, time in implementing and doing the experiments because you're gonna be very disappointed if you haven't tested your ideas on real people before. That said, you can be alone and find partners anywhere in the world. I think our community is, is quite good, maybe through Twitter or through other <laughs> social networks that, that you prefer. Finding other people to work with is fine, but doing everything alone without bouncing ideas, I think is going to be hard. Yeah, Harsha has a very great question. So Harsha says, in your opinion, have we made better progress on understanding why deep learning works since the 2017 paper? I'm guessing Harsha is referring to the yeah. um, the random labels shuffling paper. Yep. Uh, and how does this? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, but clearly, I think uh, uh, I'm very glad we published this paper back then. Uh, because it did open up a lot of people first trying to produce our results, being uh, uh, surprised by these results and, and hence starting to try to understand them. And uh, one uh, big uh, thing that happened was everything related to this uh, double descent curve, uh, where people were able to explain these results and explain what is happening at this critical point where you have enough capacity in your model to train 
your model and learn by heart every single training example. And then what happens afterward was something that was not really studied before because we didn't have the, the models that were able to train like that. So we were never looking at the, that part of the graph. And more and more people have been starting looking and now we get to understand what is happening. So I think thanks to that paper, many more people looked around and found very interesting approaches. So yeah, more understanding about what's happening here. Uh, Hi, Ghost has an excellent question. Uh, so people nowadays are, are predominantly exploring large models and probably as a effect of chasing soda. Do you have any ideas of how to encourage people to work on other things uh, in the vein of what you said earlier? Uh, so, and then uh, I think the last is an appeal. Hi, <laughs> says poor researcher is suffering because it's expensive for the trend. I think this is true. We have a compute divide. So what yes. advice would you give? How do we change the values of what research, uh, how we value research that kind of deviates from this trend? First, I think that you should always ask yourself um, if you have an idea, if before ex doing it, uh, the first question would be, if it was true, how would it change the world? Now you can think that if you work in a domain where there's already a million people working, your idea someone else will have it soon. So it's not that important to work on a domain, uh, on like on an idea where so many other people are working and these people may have more compute than you. And so even if you have a great idea, there's a high likelihood that someone else at the same time, or maybe five minutes after you, has the same idea because these ideas are in the air. You read the same papers as the other ones. So they, they have, their mind is here the same. If instead you think of an idea that is far from where everybody is, even though uh, maybe the impact might be slightly lower, as long as it's still a big impact and knowing that it's unlikely that others will have it because everybody's looking at these large models, your impact in the expectation will actually be bigger because there, it's much more unlikely that uh, others will work on that. So think about the impact on society. That's the main part, um, always. Uh, Neil has a very good question. So I think he's alluding to this fact that we have this acceleration of the idea iteration process and partly because we have a very open sharing of papers and preprints. So Neil's asking, given the barrage of papers every week in deep learning, what is your typical research process like? And how do you go about finding papers that you would actually want to read? So the, the first thing I did when I started this group uh, at Apple uh, was to start uh, implementing processes that I already had implemented at Google, which was regular seminar where people share their ideas, regular reading uh, uh, session where people jointly read papers, and, and mailing lists where people uh, discuss these papers. Because in a way, I, I use other people as filters to know what is going to be important in all these ways. Uh, I don't have time to read all these things. I don't have time to to really understand every single of these papers. But if I work with uh, 10, 100 other people that do that, together we get to have a better understanding. Again, work with other people. That's the best you can do. Um, I'm going to give you some options now because there's a few themes have come in. And I'm going to let, okay. since we're in the last four minutes, I'm going to give you some options. So a few people have asked about quantum computing, blockchain, uses of ML, wow. AI. <laughs> uh, I'll let you, <laughs> there's one option you can weigh in on is there a role of ML there. Uh, Alan, you says thoughts on geometric deep learning and what's going on there. And then a wildcard option, Zuhib says, AI research is cool, but are there dark sides to research life? And is there a good, uh, like, what are the cons, I think, is what Zuhib was asking about being a researcher. So there's three very different options. I'll let you sample. And then after that, I think we have time for one more question. So if people want to keep on adding, I'll choose one more after this. Um. Maybe the, the dark side, I like it. <laughs> What's the dark side of a researcher? Um, it's, uh, in a way, I always find myself uh, asking whether I'm in the real life. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have, I'm very lucky to be where I am, 
But what we do is so different from any other job. Uh, our, we may be missing on the real life in the way we are. In our world, with our own deadlines, which are far from you know, producing something that you can sell or that customers directly use, we're usually quite far from it. It, it does happen long after we had these ideas. So we might be disconnected from the world. And uh, of course, this might be dangerous in many ways, being disconnected from the actual needs of the people, understanding what matters for them, uh, uh, where they are suffering and all that. And this is a very big danger. I think every researcher should try to find a way to be connected to the world and, and not be in their ivory tower as we are, maybe too often. I actually think that's a good place to end. I think that was really a thoughtful answer. Um, Sammy, I cannot thank you enough. This is very meaningful. Uh, like just to be able to to talk through uh, your journey with you, but also because you've impacted my journey in so many ways over the years. So it's really lovely to have you as the first person to kick off our series. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for the enormous volume of questions. Clearly, Sammy has piqued a lot of interest in both how to throw a good party, how to do good research, <laughs> how many Europe smugs does he actually have? <laughs> so, so this maybe, is maybe. really excellent. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, uh, maybe I'll say thank you here and I'll pass off to Ellie to round us up. And thank you so much everyone for uh, coming and uh, joining this talk. It's been really lovely. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sammy. What a wonderful conversation to share with our community. Thank you both so much for taking time to do this today. And thank you everyone for joining us. If you had an awesome time today, and I'm sure you did, you definitely want to be following us on Twitter at 4AI underscore ML. That's where we announce all of our upcoming fireside chats, our community events, and you can learn more about what Cohere for AI is up to. Uh, you can also check us out online at cohere.4.ai. Thank you again so much hey, for joining Sammy. us today. Uh, Sammy has to get a Twitter account just to follow us. That's Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I, I definitely count on you to tell me what I should look at. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you. Thank you, you. everyone. Bye. Have a great day, everybody.